Welcome back to Bombastic Nation, a ting, a ting, a ting. Back with some more vibes for you, yes, I. And somebody said, hey, hey, check this one out. It's called History of Papua New Guinea. You know, I did one, I did a one episode on it, and uh, the person who sent me this says that some details were left out, so there might be no more details in this bad boy. So you know what I mean? I want to learn some more. So we're going to watch this. It's called History of Papua New Guinea. I hope you guys are having a great day, man. You know what I mean? I hope y'all's weekend was as uh, productive and as fun as mine. You know what I mean? And thing. But uh, I ain't going to talk to you guys too long. Now, by the way, uh, go ahead and drop a like on this video. Comment on this video. Keep sending the suggestions and I'll keep pumping them out. Because, you know, you teach me, I teach you, right? Let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer and check this vibe out here. For many eons, the world was barren, besides man. And these people were constantly hungry and exposed to the elements, because there was no food to eat, or materials to build shelters. So one day, there was one man who decided to change this desolate land, and he united the people, and commanded them to become the plants and the animals to populate the earth, and make it more habitable. For this reason, the earth is as lush and abundant with life as it is today. At the time of human migration, the land of New Guinea and Australia were part of one large continent called Sahul, which facilitated the migration into the land. Sahul is still technically the name of the continent, but less widely used to describe it. It is also widely accepted that the larger settlement of Oceania can be traced back to New Guinea as a stepping stone into the Pacific. Soon enough, the Arafura Sea and Torres Strait formed, from the last Ice Age ending, isolating the people of New Guinea from Australia. But this isolation was nothing new to the Papuans, as the mountains and jungles of New Guinea divided the people thoroughly. And this is why we see so many different cultures and languages form throughout the land. This island is so thoroughly culturally diverse, it would be a disservice to focus on one or even just a handful of groups. Also, sadly, the history of these people is left largely undocumented. Because of these reasons, I'm going to focus on broader strokes and more That's generalizable sad. societal traits. Let's, let's see what on they have. On this island, agriculture developed entirely separate from the agricultural revolution of the Middle East, or even the rest of the world. And here, the native people of Papua New Guinea cultivated primarily taro and bananas. This agriculture became a staple of native life in the interior of the island, while people along the coast focused more on shellfish and marine life for food. And as with most nations bordering a large body of water, trade was immensely important to Papuan life, and it is how the sweet potato, which is a staple crop of Papua New Guinea, came to the islands. Papuans began to specialize in their crafts, like pots or canoes, and so the value of Papuan goods in the Polynesian trade was high leading to Papuans enjoying a high number of imported goods compared to the low amount exported. Even on the island, trade and culture was vibrant, with many places unfit for agriculture. So, food had to be imported into these communities for other regionally exclusive goods. Most of this trade that the Papuans partook in was with the island. You know, it's kind of hard to depend on others to get your stuff to you. You know what I mean? Everybody's trying to make a quick buck. And as hard as it was back then, I mean, they didn't have the modern uh, transportation options, you know what I mean, and things. So I can't imagine just sitting there waiting. Uh, what if a, a storm comes by, because it, it is a tropical setting, so a storm comes by and stop the caravan or whatever they have from bringing the food to them. So that's that's some serious isolation going on there. You know what I mean? Maybe that's the reason why the cultures have survived for so long because they, you know, they live in such an isolated spot. You know what I mean? You know, people like to go in and say, "Well, come believe this and you know believe that." It's kind of it's kind of cool because to think that there's some tribes that still live like that for other regionally exclusive goods. Most of this trade that the Papuans partook in was with the island dwellers to the east and with Australian peoples to the south. Although not as common as in the west of the island, Papuans enjoyed a healthy trade relationship with Southeast Asia, primarily with the nations of Indonesia. In this trade, the most valuable commodity that the Papuans had was the feathers of their birds of paradise. It is hard to tell whether these people traded directly with Chinese traders, or if Chinese goods reached the island from their trade with Indonesian nations. 
But either way, there have been many Chinese artifacts found in Papua New Guinea. However, the people here were limited by the natural resources found on the island. Restrict it's like the Chinese have been doing this for centuries, haven't they, you know? Uh, they have modified the way they're doing it. No, back then it was with war. Now it's with the economy, you know? So I guess we have progress to a certain degree, but they're still not China specifically, but almost every nation that's become like a superpower has used military might to also solidify their positions. You know what I'm saying and things? Directing them mostly to stone and bone tools. This doesn't mean that bronze or iron tools were unheard of. They were just very rare to find and had to be imported from mainland Asia. Soon, the European powers entered their colonial period, and Portuguese and Spanish ships would spot the coast of New Guinea, with the first European to land in Papua New Guinea being Inyo Ortiz de Retes. Retes landed on the north coast of the island, and claimed the land for the Spanish crown, calling it Nueva Guinea, or New Guinea, as he believed the native people resembled those of the African people of Guinea. Although, this claim made by Retes would be lost to time, did you, did she, <laughs> they just go places and they see people and, oh, they look like them, so they must be them. You know, the same thing happened with the Native, Amer Native Americans here, you know. My man thought he was in India because he was searching for an easier route, trade route to India. Because, uh, you know, trade was huge with them. Therefore, all the exotic, you know, imports and stuff like that. Exotic food and clothes and, you know, stuff like that. But anyway, so he just called them Indians. And, you know, he went there and because they remind him of a, a tribe somewhere else that he's been, he just said, mm, they look like the people from Guinea. Let's just call this New Guinea because they look like him. That's crazy, you know. Just give people's place a name, not even taking into consideration their name that they have for it. As no colonists were ever sent to settle the land, but the name stuck. The frequency at which European traders and whalers came to the islands steadily increased as their global influence spread, bringing foreign technologies to the island people, especially as colonies began to establish around New Guinea. These European contacts were initially primarily hostile, as cultural differences led to miscommunications between the parties. But, as both sides began to understand each other's practices, and understand the value of the goods to be traded, the encounters became increasingly peaceful. Nicolas Mikula necessity was the first European to spend a significant amount Peace of time amongst the native people of Papua New Guinea, documenting many customs and ways of life, familiarizing the native people to Europeans, but also unknowingly paving the way for future colonization. Very soon after, missionaries began landing on the island to try to convert the local people to Christianity. Both the British and Dutch had been expanding their influence in the region, and after these powers had been entering disputes with one another over their colonial possessions, they decided on the Treaty of London, which, for the first time ever, politically split the island of New Guinea in two. The Dutch claimed the West, while the East was left for future colonization efforts by the British. The English focus was mostly on the colonization of the southern coast, due to its proximity to their Australian colony. Around this time, the German nation had recently united and wanted to expand, Seeing that the north coast of New Guinea was one of the few places in the world not yet colonized, the Germans focused on this land, surveying it heavily and establishing a trade relationship with the locals. This increased German presence scared the Australian colony of Queensland, as the Torres Strait was a vital trade route. So, Henry Chester was sent to the land to declare it a protectorate of the British Empire. The British honestly did not care about the land, and felt it was too expensive of a venture to colonize, due to the interior being almost entirely uncharted, and the unwelcoming nature of the native people towards colonization. But once the Germans declared a protectorate in the north, and Queensland promised aid in the financial aspect of the colony, the British declared the lands a protectorate of their empire. Now, the German and British empires began small outposts on the coasts, and eventually, the British transferred authority over the territory to the Australians. Relations with the native people took a turn for the worst, as plantations were established all along the coastline, using the native people as their workforce. There were several new efforts by missionaries to convert locals, even building missions in the untamed inland. With the it's, it's funny how they, uh, 
how politics and religion work hand in hand when they go colonize places, you know what I mean? Let's send the religious people in, you know, teach them. Because, okay, I've noticed, it's just a thought while I was thinking about that. In certain places, like where I'm from, they have the you know, religious group there, but they, they, they talk about peace and love and goodwill to men. That's what I thought religion was all about, you know what I mean? Because it was, they was always preaching pre peace at us. But then you, you go to certain areas and then they teach the strong and the, 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 the mighty and, and the revengeful power of God to a certain group of people. So they feel strong and powerful, whereas people like the were colonized would feel that they need to be peaceful because that's what they were taught. At least that's how I sort of see it. You know what I mean? Uh, I think it worked opposite in Haiti. I'm doing a series on the Haitian Revolution. One of them is coming up again here soon. But, you know, it's like the group that needed to be subdued is taught peace and love, goodwill to men and all of that, you know, that side of the Bible. And the group that is needed to help keep that other group, you know, at a certain behavior is taught, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you know, brimstone and fire and stuff like that. More so than the other group, because that's what it seems like. Because I, I always thought, whenever I hear the Bible, I thought about peace and love. It's just a little thought there, talking about uh, the missionaries going in and stuff like that. Uh, being from the islands, man, we had a share of missionaries coming there. Lots of them. Lots. The breakout of World War One. The German colony posed a serious threat to merchant ships in the Pacific, as the German Pacific fleet could refuel there, and radio towers could inform these ships of British movements in the area. So, the Australians were tasked with neutralizing this base of operations. A force of 2,000 men was gathered, and sent to first attack the island of New Pomerania, where fighting occurred that ultimately ended in an Australian victory and the destruction of German radio towers. The attack on the mainland saw no opposition, which ended the Papuan Front in the Pacific, and in the Treaty of Versailles, the lands of German New Guinea were given to the Commonwealth of Australia. The islands of New Mecklenburg and New Pomerania were subsequently renamed New Ireland and New Britain, respectively. Expeditions into the heartland of New Guinea increased in scope and Let's size, just name these places after where us. many tribes unfamiliar with Europeans were contacted for the first time. Infrastructure was also improved, and new settlements were erected. Since 1919. From the beginning of the Second World War, Papua New Guinea was a main target for Japan, as it would create the perfect point to attack Australia from, and cripple the British naval capabilities in the Pacific. Japan had a strong presence in the Pacific by the time they invaded New Britain, and at the town of Rabaul, they gained their first foothold in Papua New Guinea. Due to the centralization of European influence in the land, being around a few towns along the coast, the capture of Rabaul meant the capture of the island of New Britain. From this base, the Japanese launched their attack on the mainland at Leh and Salamawa. But the continuation of this Japanese attack depended heavily on the infrastructure of the land. So, the Australian army situated in the region, who knew that they were outnumbered, focused on destroying the easiest ways to Port Moresby, the most important town on the island. The Japanese army recognized the difficulty of passing through the thick jungles and mountain ranges of the island to reach Port Moresby, especially after the Australians damaged the infrastructure. So, they sent a fleet and troops around the island to attack Port Moresby from the water and in the Coral Sea. The first ever battle between aircraft carriers took place as oh, two wow. American carriers defended the waves, ending in an American victory at sea. So now, Japan was forced to attack Port Moresby by land. But by this time, American troops were supporting the Australian army. Although having a preferable defensive position, the Australians were struggling in their air combat against the Japanese, which severely weakened the possibility of defense and allowed the Japanese forces to push far inland. The Japanese front made it within earshot of Port Moresby, but they had stretched their supply lines much too thin and so retreated with the allies at their heels. Logistics were the Japanese army's worst enemy here, as most of their troops didn't die in battle, but of disease and starvation. Here, the Japanese began to waver steadily, and then retreat from the islands, leaving over 200,000 dead from both sides. Wow. The native Papuans played a key role in fighting against the Japanese, and so, to show gratitude once the war concluded, 
The Australian government granted more autonomy and a local government to the island holding in the Papua and New Guinea Act. Before this act, the territory was divided along its old colonial border between Germany and Britain in two administrative bodies, the territories of Papua and New Guinea. But these lands were now unified into one Papua and New Guinea, to be later renamed Papua New Guinea. The lands, though, remained divided by the harsh terrain. So, aircraft was and remains the primary long-distance mode of travel across the island. Also after the Second World War, the United Nations, in efforts to aid in the process of decolonization, declared the lands of Papua New Guinea as a trust territory, under the trusteeship of Australia. Trust territories were expected to be developed by their governing nations, to aid them in a modern global economy. So, under the recommendations of the World Bank, the Australian government set out in developing Papua New Guinea. What followed was immense developments to improve agriculture, help the nation be more self-sufficient by increasing cattle production, improving education, and many, many more investments. A gradual move towards independence was paired with this development, and, eventually, the territory gained independence, joining the United Nations soon after. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, though, as the nation lacked a sense of unity, being a nation divided both geographically and culturally. Yeah. In hopes to avoid a civil war with hundreds of different cultural groups all wanting more representation, the first Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Michael Samare, divided the nation into 22 provinces, with representatives in the government and local autonomy. The island of Bougainville still felt as though they deserved independence, but as copper from the Panguna copper mine made up 45% of Papua New Guinea's export income, this was not an option. Conflict arose, and soon the island was in a civil war between the national forces and rebel fighters. The Panguna mine was closed due to this fighting, and civilian casualties were very high. Eventually, Papua New Guinea retreated from the island and changed their tactic to blockading the island from the sea and air. This blockade continued for a long while, until a ceasefire was negotiated between the parties. But this would be violated by the national forces, as an offensive was opened up once again. Then, under outside pressures, negotiations reopened, and it was agreed that Bougainville was to have a referendum on independence. After a landslide defeat for the Papuans, Bougainville decided to leave the nation. The government of Papua New Guinea is extremely scared of this independence, due to the abundance of resources in Bougainville, and that this might set a precedent for other parts of the nation to follow suit in declaring independence themselves. Either way, the nation is currently discussing the conditions for the independence of the island. Now for once, the division in the nation worked to its benefit, as COVID-19 has had a very difficult time spreading throughout Papua New Guinea. As well, Papua New Guinea has worked very closely with the World Health Organization on how to proceed with the virus, which has helped keep the national cases and deaths very low. And that is the state of the nation of Papua New Guinea. Please like and subscribe if you like the video and want to see more. Oh man, that was cool. That was cool. Information out the wazoo. Hey, I'm going to leave a link in the description for this video. Go over there, check out my man's channel. Thank you for suggesting that I watch this. Lots of information there. You know, it was like a play-by-play -play thing that was really good, you know? Hope you guys are enjoying enjoyed it as much as I did. But anyway, by the way, don't stop watching. Just click on the bottom here. Keep watching. Binge watch. Get your popcorn, get your juice, get whatever, you know, whatever it is you, you fancy. Take a, a, a chill pill and check out some bombastic nation. Just keep watching. You understand what I'm saying? Listen, in the meantime, you all take care of each other, all right? Cool, right?